advisor and host of the AI Summit. Um, I'm also the author of the book Behavioral Mathematics for Game AI, which came out, oh geez, about 11 years ago. Uh, but I've written for a number of other books, not only on uh, AI, but also on uh, other subjects like game design, and I used to write for the now defunct Game Developer Magazine. Um, I've done plenty of lectures, not only at the AI Summit, uh, but at other conferences all over the place, as well as universities. Um, in fact, uh, twice here, 2014 2015, uh, I've spoken here at uh, ECGC. Um, I do AI consulting now for quite a while. Uh, I was the lead architect of the uh, canceled EverQuest Next. No, it's not canceled because of the AI. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I worked then for a year uh, at ArenaNet working on uh, the Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns expansion. ArenaNet now runs entirely on my AI engine. Uh, and then I spent a year working for uh, John Smedley of uh, Pixel Mage Games uh, when he started his own studio doing the Online pixel art procedural roguelike. Dude. Yeah, how often do you hear those you know, just glued together? Just this once. But yeah, just this once. Thank you. You've never been to any of my other lectures. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I am actually probably best known these days uh, for being the guy that got hit by the car and almost killed at GDC 2018. Uh, yes. Oh, you're that so, guy. Yes, I'm that guy. Yes, isn't that weird? Uh, and if any of you want uh, more information later, I have plenty of fantastic pictures of my body, including spectacular metal bolts through my pelvis. But uh, I am really old, and so when I got into gaming, if you will, uh, it, it was in this fashion. Yes, yeah, see, there's somebody who's also my age, right? And those are the real books right yes. there. That's version 2 AD&D. Um, but th this was, you know, my introduction to what, you know, is, is role-playing gaming. As a matter of fact, you know, when I was a teenager, instead of having, you know, pictures on my bedroom wall of, you know, really cool cars or rock bands or, or sexy women, no, I had the world of Greyhawk map <laughs> hanging in my bedroom. Um, and I would absolutely just love um, looking up at that and reading the books about these different countries and different regions and, and the types of people or creatures that live there. And there was this whole world that I imagined being in. And of course, you know, you, you, most of the, the uh, official modules from, uh, from TSR, you know, took place in that world. And so you could start, you know, with your level one stuff, you know, here. And I, I love the A series, the, uh, the, the slavers. Um, and these all chained after each other, and after you finish that, you know, there was the, uh, the uh, Against the Giants, G1, 2, and 3, uh, you ended up with the Queen of the Demon Web Pets and everything, you, and you have gone through this world where all of these things have taken place. And that fascinated me. It felt like there in my bedroom, this world was alive. It existed. And of course then, you know, it's mid-80s now, and so uh, all of a sudden here on, on the computers, you know, wait a minute, hang on, you can do this on computers. You know, this is screenshots from some of the original Ultimas. Uh, I believe this was probably three, maybe, four. Um, so, somebody knew that, thank you. Um, and of course, you know, as, as you proceeded on with that, Ultima had its own world. Uh, you know, and this was a cloth map that they would send with you, you know, with Ultima five or six or whatever it was. Um, and then, of course, you know, late 90s, we put that out there so we could all play together with Ultima Online. I was on day two because I was on a business trip day one. My box was waiting for me when I came home. And of course, that was fascinating because when we would go into that world, you know, it looked like this. People, you know, hanging around in town, talking to each other, chatting with each other. Of course, after a little while, it started to look more like that. And then for some reason, everybody got dragons, and so it looked like this. Um, <laughs> But I remembered very well, uh, it was a couple of weeks in, and I had bought some dye pots. And I was charging people money to dye their clothes different colors, whatever they wanted. So it was a very uh, you know, business-oriented thing. Um, so I'm standing there in a town square, I think it was intrinsic, actually. And this guy runs up to me and says, hey. I'm like, yeah. So what do I do? What do you mean? What am I supposed to do? Well, uh, you know, I'm not, not sure I follow you. In the game, what are you supposed to do? Uh, anything you want? No, I mean, what's the story? The story? Yeah, where's the first part of the story? Of course, now I'm starting to catch on you know, where this guy's going with this. I said, well, you see that gate to the city over there? 
Is that where you go for the first story? Look, you go out that gate, and whatever happens to you is your first story. And then it'll tell me where to go? <laughs> Someone might. Of course, what I knew is that there were some uh, player killers right outside the city. Oh. <laughs> That's actually why I was making gold dyeing people's clothes instead of going out there myself. But I guarantee you, I never saw the guy again, at least as far as I'm aware, but I guarantee you that he had a story, something that happened to him. <laughs> Off he went. Um, and this really highlighted to me something that is, I've kind of been building on just mentally over the years, however long it's been since I came out, 20 years now, um, is there's a difference between having the experience and having an experience in games. And what do I mean by this? With the experience, you know, we go into a game and it's okay, we go and do this first thing and go to a place, and then after we're done with that, it says, oh, and then you go here, down this hall, and then it sends you over, you know, you do this thing and you go to that place. And we have this narrative that's happening, and yes, I'm friends with the narrative people down the hall. <laughs> um, and so we have, you know, this experience. Now, we, we gradually started having, okay, well, here's this branching point that if you make this uh, different decision, here's this other experience that you can have. But the thing is, it is that very linear sort of thing. Whereas with an experience, yeah, we may all start in the same spot, do that first thing, but after that, based on what we do, what the world does, etc., we don't know what's going to happen next. It isn't that linear thing. So with, with the experience, if you went into work the next day, had the, the uh, uh, stereotypical water cooler conversation, um, you might say to a, uh, one of your friends, hey, did you get to that part of the game yet where such and such happens? Um, whereas if you have had a game with an experience, you might say, oh my god, you will not believe what happened to me in the game last night. That is your story. It happened to you. You are telling your story rather than we all have the same story. And a lot of this comes down to um, the, the reason that we have a hard time going to an experience is because of authorial control. You know, we've got very talented designers and writers, and etc., and they have in their mind the experience that they want their players to, to go through. And that's fine. There's a lot of times when that is a great way of doing things. Here's the problem, though, is, uh, you know, as you say, you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Um, especially with MMOs, but even with open world uh, single player games, their budgets can get way the heck up there. You know, MMO budgets for large things, you know, get up above $100 million. And most of that is content creation, art, writing, VL, level design, gameplay scripting, etc. So it's all of this story based content that is being created that is pretty much single use. You play it once, get your butt in here. Yeah, so I'm talking. <laughs> Anybody with blue hair, yeah. I know him. <laughs> um, Looking at him, can I come in now? <laughs> anyway, but single use, play it once, and it's come up, I came up with a term a number of years ago uh, that never mind MMORPG, I call it an MPSPE. That stands for Massively Parallel Single Player Experience. <laughs> and it's basically, we're all doing the same story, we just happen to be running past each other in town as we're each going to our next part of the thing. It has nothing to do with each other in this world. We just happen to be sharing the same server. You know, so great. You know, here I am playing my, my part of the story. And while I'm doing that, somebody else is playing the exact same story next to me. They may be, you know, a little bit before, a little bit behind, whatever. And of course, in, in an MMO, if you will, or an MPSPE, it's not a pronounceable acronym, by the way. Um, we have all of these people playing the exact same story next to each other. Well, when they get done with the story, now what? You know, it's just like, okay, um, great, you know, that was cool, but you know, where's the rest now that I'm done with the story? And there's nothing in that world to do. Well, of course, you know, you could say, well, let's just add PvP. No, no, don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> So, of course, you know, one way that, you know, game companies have gone about, you know, well, let's see what we can do about this, is they have repetitive content, like timer-based events, you know, recurring events that end up becoming very predictable, 
As a matter of fact, uh, when I was working at ArenaNet, uh, I was pointed to a, a site where somebody, uh, a group of people had said, if you are on this map and you do this event, when you finish it, if you immediately run across the map to this location, that timed event will just be starting, and you can usually finish it in this many minutes, and if, when you're done with that, run over to here. They had nothing to do with each other, they were just min-maxing what's the quickest way to get to all of the time defense and maximize what you're going to you know, be using your time on. So yeah, uh, timer-based events, not so cool. Okay, we can do instanced raids, as we're all familiar with. Of course, you know, World of Warcraft made that uh, enormously popular. Um, but those are often detached from the real world, if, you know, by in the game real world. It's really weird that we have two different real worlds. Um, but, and they don't have any effect on that real world. You either win or lose in this instant raid, you can try it over again, you know, but it doesn't matter to the rest of the game. Um, it's very much like a Groundhog Day sort of experience. And of course, after a little while, your rest of your, your buds in, in your clan, your guild, like, are we seriously going to do that event again? You know, it's the same thing over and over. I'll just, you know, read your script, play your part, let's see if we can do a little bit better this time. Great. So I think back to my D&D &D days, and uh, I've mentioned Against the Giants, the module. A G1 was a, a, what was called, Steading of the Hill Giant King. And it had, you know, this cool map. This was a fort where the hill giants lived. And if you, you know, read through the book, um, there was this great hall where this huge party was happening. And here you see all the people that are in the hall uh, doing all this, you know, okay, they're having a party, as hill giants are inclined to do, apparently. Um, they do mention that, you know, various servants and orc slaves will be entering the great hall from the west, you know, bringing stuff in and out. Um, but the, the, uh, they even had some wandering monster tables. But you'll notice that you know, it says Great Hall, uh, let's see, in the eastern section, the giantess may be coming from 11 to, or, to get her cave bear, but most of the action is happening in that party. All right. Um, okay, so here's the chief's chamber there, and there's uh, his wife's chamber. Um, and, you know, it says what's in it. And, you know, a cave bear can be in 11 if she, if, you know, she hasn't gotten it yet. By the way, as a brief note, uh, okay, there's the chief's chamber, excuse me. Yeah, it's been a while since I did this lecture. The thing is, you could go and camp out in the chief's chamber, and he's at the party, and at no time does it say that he ever leaves. You could just hang out there as long as you want. Uh, what I was going to point out is, by the way, notice that this room has no doors on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, if you look in the book, that's where, what is it, the servants of the <coughs> other, uh, the, the female hill giants stay. I don't know whether they're not allowed to come out of the room or not allowed to go into the room, but there's no door on there. So I just thought that I didn't notice that for you know 30 years until I was making this lecture. But anyway, you can stay in the Hill, Hill Giants room day and night. You can stay there as long as you want and just wait because it doesn't ever say he goes back to his room. All right, well, shit, how do we handle this? Um, well... If you're a hill giant, they're just like, okay, well, we're going to you know, party on. Uh, wow, all okay. right. Hmm. How should I do this? I need to think like a hill giant. But it reminds me a little bit of uh, my friend Rez Graham uh, at one of the, uh, the AI Summit uh, uh, Touring Tantrum AI Devs rant uh, that we've been doing for years and years there. He put this screenshot up. This is from uh, Dragon Age Origins, I believe. And he said, this is what I call the eternal wagon. There's an elf who's sitting there and will constantly be messing with this wagon. I mean, I can unite the kingdoms of elves and dwarves and men all together, fight the archdemon and come back, and after all that time, this guy's still fucking with this wagon. <laughs> we see this in games all the time. How do we handle this? Okay. What would a hill giant do? And that's great. You know, as a DM, you can kind of wing it and everything. Um, and we have all of these talented writers and designers that I talked about. Well, you know, they're really good at what they do, right? Here's the problem. There's so many instances like this that can come up in games. You can't write it all. Again, disclaimer, I am friends with the folks down the hall, all the narrative people. They believe. They're like, yeah, your game's right. So I'm not attributing that quote to anybody, though. That would give me trouble. Um, Okay, so here's a thought. You work really hard at 
putting your game together, right? And you ship it, and people like it. Great. Um, you know, but after a while, you know, they say, okay, you know, our, my enjoyment's going down um, because I've kind of done everything there is to do in the game. Well, that sucks. Well, okay, how about this? We work really hard on a game, we ship it, people like it, and, you know, and gradually their excitement is going down. But while that's happening, we're working again on more of the game so we can ship an expansion or an update or some sort of extra release and there's more content. And you ship it and people like it, but of course, you know, their excitement does go down again with the extra stuff. You, but that's fine. You know, we'll do more. Oh, it's like Thanksgiving dinner, though. People are eating it faster than we can cook it. Hmm. All right. Uh, even if you were working on it, you know, and working on it some more, you're going to be shipping all these things. They might like it, but uh, you're putting in a lot of work for less and less uh, uh, you know, payback. Okay, how about this? You work really hard on the game, and you ship it, and people like it, but then the game continues, and they continue to like it because they don't get bored of it because it's always different for them. Notice what's missing here is there's no green bar underneath that. There's no, I'm going back to working on my game some more and shipping an expansion. So I'm going to ask you to trust me on this. <laughs> All right? Just roll with me on this. We can do this. Because, yeah, we have a lot of de designers and, and writers that are very talented. What if we were to pair them with someone else just as amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you could both be cool together. <laughs> so let's see what we can do here. Some of the things I'm going to be covering, uh, talking about emergent AI, and by that I mean unscripted uh, AI that understands the world without hand-holding or scripting, and is also very adaptable. And emergent AI is not a new thing. I'd like to think that I invented it, but I did not. Um, and then also I'm going to be touching on procedural content. The world changes, the world provides information, not only to players, but to the, to the NPCs as well, and the agents understand that information and can do things with it. Now, one of the problems with the, these sorts of things is that you kind of need to be able to trust your NPCs, that they're going to, you know, you know pull you up in this regard. Um, you have to trust that your NPCs are going to support the gameplay, be where they need to be, say what they need to say, look good doing it, certainly. All right, so how do you go about trusting your NPCs? Well, you could actually put in some really cool AI, of course, you know, like this here, for example. But when you talk about AI, a lot of times your designers and writers and everything have a reaction, not unlike this, because they say, no, 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 I want to be able to control what my NPC does at all times. Read the script, play your part. I know exactly what they want to do. I, marionette strings. All right, so let's talk about utility-based AI. This is what my book was on. I've spoken about it many billions of times, uh, not only at GDC, but in other places as well. As a matter of fact, if you look at that list of lectures that I've done, uh, utility AI is in a lot of them. Uh, it's, it's strangely became, started becoming known as Dave Mark's utility AI there for a while, and I've been trying to quell that. But what is utility AI? In general, it's using numbers, formulas, and scores to rate the relative benefit of possible actions. And it can be used with other architectures, you know, like selectors and behavior trees, uh, or edge weights and planners and stuff like that. But it can also be used as a standalone decision reasoner. Uh, you're probably very familiar with it without necessarily knowing the term, because that was what was underlying in the Sims. You know, I have needs and wants and drives, and these objects are going to satisfy some of them to varying degrees, and that's how the Sims decided what it was that they wanted or needed to do next, was through what's the relative benefit of those actions, what are their utility. Um, now, with emergent behavior, because you <coughs> is constantly checking what's the best thing for me to do, it really gives the AI the ability to think for itself. It rarely ever gets stuck. It isn't predictable, but it looks reasonable. And after all, a lot of times that's what we're after. Um, the same decision model can run combat, tactical, ambient behaviors, etc., like that, but it also can be taken over at any moment to support scripted interactions. Uh, and then handed back to a more autonomous system if they're okay. You don't have to go push the big red button. All right, do whatever you think is best. Uh, as I mentioned, I've done plenty of lectures on utility at GDC. Uh, most importantly, if you look, just go to GDC Vault. Dot com and search for the word centaur. 
this will come up. Uh, I did with Mike Lewis, a good friend and, and, and colleague of mine, when I was at ArenaNet. This is my IAUS architecture. It stands for Infinite Access Utility System. Um, but this will give you an idea of not only from a programming standpoint, but from a design standpoint of how your designers can use utility AI to do nifty things. All right, so part of the key to doing this, though, is uh, putting intelligence in the world. Um, so a lot of times we're used to having NPCs on Rails. They're either at a fixed location, like shopkeepers or quest givers, uh, or town criers or whatever, um, or they're on things like patrol routes that have been placed by a designer. It gives an <coughs> illusion of activity, but if you stand and watch it for a little while, you're like, wow, that person's doing the exact same path over and over again. Uh, or you can use it to provide challenges, like guards that are on a patrol path. It's like, okay, and after he goes there, he's going to turn the corner, and now I'm going to sneak out. Um, but this is what happens, though, is we have these NPCs on Rails. The designer says, okay, we're going to start here, and then we're going to go to that point here, and then we're going to go over here to point three, and then point four. Okay, great. But what about all these other cool places? Well, I didn't tell them to go there. Okay, well, of course, one of the problems, as I mentioned, is you end up with like a very repeating pattern, and we, as, as human brains, are really, really good at detecting repeating patterns. All right, so what if we were to put the intelligence into the world? By tagging certain locations or objects with information, we can also you know, put tags on NPCs, we can put them on objects and locations, as I mentioned. Uh, we can use something called influence maps, which I've also done other lectures on uh, before. But now we can have NPCs that wander because maybe we just tagged locations and objects in the world that, you know what, these are very interesting places for you to go. You're a villager, you're a, a guard, you're, you know, a, a, a bunny rabbit, I don't care. You have interesting places to go, and then you just turn the NPC loose, and they say, okay, well, I'm going to go here, and after that, oh, how about this one over there, uh, and then I'm going to go here, and this one, and I'm going to be bouncing around, and I might even go back to one of the ones I visited before, etc. cetera, uh, or even perhaps go back to the start. But the thing is, nobody determined that. The NPC just decided I'm going to go to another nearby interesting place. And so, like, if you ran a different NPC through it, they may go through it this way instead. Which, imagine if you're standing in a village, now you're not seeing repeating patterns. You're seeing people just looking like they're doing whatever they want. That makes sense. Yeah, I can see why he's doing that. Right. The cool thing about this is, is if, let's say your level designer came back and said, I'm going to add this other little place right up here. That we just added a piece of art and we tagged it as another one of the interesting places. Now the NPC is automatically going to include it in what it does. No designer intervention necessary. They might go through it from any of those. They might go all the way across to these others after it's done. All just by putting a new object with that tag in there. No designer intervention necessary. <coughs> um, the other thing too is, part of doing this is you don't, you don't have any more manual placement of waypoints. Um, so it takes less designer time to actually say, well, I'm going to have this, this is his route that he's doing. Uh, it's much more flexible and far more extensible. As I mentioned, you can just drop things in. Um, but how can we trust them to look good? Okay, well, that's, that's important. Um, obviously, we, you know, many of us know about pathfinding, you know, A star and whatnot, and there's, you know, no, it's not a solved problem, but it's pretty darn close. But um, what I do is I talk about constraining paths. So let's say we have a village and there's a bunch of these buildings around. And around some of these buildings, oh, and, and there's a, a cluster of, uh, of like uh, uh, market stalls in the center right here, right? And some of these buildings have grassy areas around them. Um, and otherwise it's just dirt, you know, for all intents and purposes road. You know, some person comes into the, to the town here and they're going all the way over there. Well, if I ran A star across this, like, okay, what's the, the shortest route? and it would be something like this. Well, the thing is, okay, first of all, why did you walk through Mr. Johnson's lawn? That was kind of rude. Uh, and you cut between these two buildings here, that's not very nice, and you just don't cut through the middle of the, the cluster of market stalls, like just go around, right? Um, okay, well, what uh, I've done is what's called a path uh, preference profile. And what we do is we have a profile entry for a, a type of thing that includes a terrain type, and a preference. And what I use is requires, prefers, likes, neutral, dislikes, avoids, and forbidden. And so those are, what do you think about this particular terrain type? Do you like it or not? 
And so it might look something like this. You might say, I prefer walking on roads. Uh, I like walking on grass. It's kind of, you know, there's these inappropriate places like cutting through the market stalls. So I'm going to say dislike on that. Um, so if I were to apply that on my pathfinding, I take this exact same start and end location. Well, don't cut through the grass. Don't go through the market stalls and stuff like. And that looks a lot more reasonable. And you can actually merge this in with A star so that A star knows. Okay, well, we're going to do it this way. And by the way, we actually did it uh, with uh, for out of combat and in combat because you know what? I'm in combat. I don't care about stepping on your grass at the moment. Um, but the other thing, too, is by creating these profiles, you can assign different ones to different types of creature. So this would be perfect for a humanoid walking through the, uh, the village like this, but the dog, the dog says, screw it, I'm just going to go away, oh, I'm going to run through the grass, I'm going to go around here, stuff like that, because it doesn't matter. And it's doing that, running through a very uh, a different pathfinding preference profile. Another way that this is good is like it, manual escort missions. Okay, here's the forest, and there's this road that goes through the forest. And a designer has said, okay, yeah, here's our four waypoints that we're going to be using. And so, okay, great, you're doing this. The escort mission is probably going to go like this on the road, right? All right, let's say you're cruising along, and when you're on your way to point two, you get into combat, you get kited off into this forest over here, um, and there's this, this great kerfuffle that happens, and afterwards, it's like, okay, good, we're out of combat, let's resume our escort mission. Oh, we were on our way to point two, so we're going to go back to point two, and then continue on to point three. What the hell was that? You know, why did you go away from where it was you were going? Because point two was next. Well, why didn't you just go here? Well, if you were to do uh, with the Pathfinding Preference Profile. Okay, great. You're cruising along. You get carted off into the forest here. The kerfuffle ensues, as we mentioned. Um, and then, okay, it's done. How, all we're looking at is how do we get to our goal? Yeah, we'd rather be on the road instead of the forest, but we're not going to go the opposite direction to have it happen. And so we might do that. Notice that we, yeah, we're, we're not going straight to that corner where point three was. We're trying to get on the road as quick as we can, but we're moving in the direction of our goal. Easy enough. One of the ways that we tested this uh, to, to show that it was really cool is that we made a, uh, we had a creek like this, and we had a start and end point that are on opposite sides of the creek, but it looked similar to this. Uh, much better artwork in, in uh, Guild Wars 2. Um, and we had two path preference profiles. We had our humanoid one that we talked about earlier, and then there was like a, this kind of river lizard uh, monster. Uh, it would look like this. Notice that it avoided roads. Uh, it preferred going in shallow water. Uh, it even liked the sand along the, t the side of the river. <coughs> um, and then it also liked mud. All right, well, we did it first with the humanoid. And when the humanoid did it, it's like, well, I'm going to stay out of the creek as long as possible, cut across it a little bit to get to the other side, and then I'm at my goal. When we gave it to the river lizard, it looked a lot more like this. Oh good, there's a creek that I can go into. I'm going to get there pretty quick. I'm going to stay in the creek and only get out at the end. Just by having two different path preference profiles. So talk about trusting your, your NPCs to look good going someplace. You have no more manual placement of waypoints. NPCs can get from anywhere to anywhere. And we can, uh, different types of path behaviors, again, combat versus non-combat. Okay, well, so we also need to kind of give these NPCs real lives. Uh, you know, and the way we've been doing that normally in games is they stand still, they do a random wander, or a patrol path as we talked about. Um, they often spawn in the same place, just like in our video beforehand. Um, that's not really a method of giving somebody life in a game. Well, I remember back to Ultima 5, going back to Ultima again here. And, okay, right, here's this, this town. Uh, and there was this guy who was in charge of running the, uh, uh, the, the orchard. Um, and there was this person that they were behind the counter because they ran the, the inn here. Uh, and there was this uh, waiter or waitress or something like that, you know, a server, I suppose they're called now. Um, okay, that's kind of cool. But what really got me is in a different town, there was this person here who was running the reagent shop. And in the middle of the day or in the evening, I can't remember when it was because it was many years ago, they would close their shop and go over and have a meal at the inn. 
And if you went out to that person while they were in the inn and said, said, oh, I'd like to buy reagents, well, come see me when my shop is open. Oh my God, these people have a schedule. And eventually, yeah, they would go back, you know, and run their shop. And of course, you could really piss them off by waking them up in the middle of the night saying, I'd like to buy reagents. Um, that did not go well. Um, so we, we can have all these different spaces and places. You know, we can have different items in the shop marked as a point of interest. We can have soldier patrol points, as I've talked about. Social locations. Like, uh, yeah, we're going to hang around, out around the campfire, or we're going to go to the tavern, etc. We can have points of interest, like market stalls, a well, a campfire, as I mentioned. All of these can have tags that help to give the NPCs real life. So we can have different point types for different preferences. You know, this is a home, this is a, a work location, this is a social location, something that's opportunistic. You know, like, oh, hey, uh, there's the bar it is doing, and I'm going by, so I'll clap for the bar, and then I'll continue on. Um, we can also have a behavior model select that next action and destination by the time of day, by our current preference, again, think the Sims, or even just by proximity, oh, I'm fairly close to this. All right, so let's go back to our village, and we actually have different types of buildings, and of course, all of them have these different tags that have the information in it. So, person comes into the village, this is an NPC that wanders into the village and says, okay, well, first I'm going to stop at this shop. And then after that, I'm going to go over, because it's the time of day, I'm going to go over to the tavern, have a bite to eat, maybe a pint. And then after that, I am going to go home. Wow, okay, well, that's kind of cool. They just went to those places because of their behaviors and the tags and the information. Somebody else comes into town, different NBC, different needs, different time of day, whatever the case. But these buildings are still the same. They come in. They say, oh, well, as long as I'm right here, I'm going to stop at the tavern because I've been traveling all day. And then after that, I'm going to go over to the shop because I need to buy or sell some stuff. And after that, I'm going to go stay at the inn. No designer intervention necessary. You've let these NPCs do what it is that they feel that they want to do next. Okay, so, well, what about when they're in this tavern? There's <coughs> opportunity in there, right? We'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, tending shop. Let's say we go into a building, and it has all these, you know, has a counter and a whole bunch of different displays. Now, normally what we're used to is the, the uh, person who runs that shop is going to stand behind the counter and stare at you when you walk in the door. What if we were to have a whole bunch of these invisible little markers here uh, by all of those displays, and we said, one of your behaviors is go to something and play a fidget animation that you're messing with it. Well, then that shopkeeper may wander over here, you know, over there, to these different places, not scripted, not in a particular path, just go to some place that you haven't been in a little while. And of course, eventually they may go and stand behind the counter again for a little bit, and that's fine. But anytime you walk in that shop, think about what we do when we go into a, a, a store to buy something. We look around and say, Oh, okay, there's the, the, the shopkeeper over here. They're doing things. So now just by adding tags with this information and telling the shopkeeper, hey, go do what you do, we've made it feel more alive. Um, so we can also have these contextual p uh, points of interest. Um, you know, like in a tavern, we could have a counter, different tables, a back room where they, you know, or a kitchen and stuff like that. Uh, we can have some soup on the hearth that they may go over and stir and tend. Um, a smithy may have an anvil, a water barrel, on a forge. And you just tell them, mess with those three things. And they move back and forth and, you know, they're pounding on something on the anvil and they dip it in the water barrel, whatever. Uh, they can even have a supply pile. If your designer came later, I've added the supply pile and I've tagged it, so the smithy now knows that he can use it. Um, the other thing, too, is using behavior packages. And this is something I talk about in, in depth in that uh, Building a Better Centaur lecture. But those are sentimental <coughs> behaviors that are in addition to what that character was born with. So they're situational packages that can be handed out by an event, an object, even on a completely different map, to something that's only relevant to that map. And they get processed right along with the other behaviors for that species. So here we have this creature ba brain, uh, brain excuse me, that has a behavior package with some stuff in it. But then we might be able to say, okay, let's push on these behavior packages that get dealt with right along with all the others until they're not needed and then they get removed. Okay, well, what would be a good example of this? Let's say a villager goes into the tavern because it's tagged as a social location. They go in there 
And the tavern has a tripwire that as soon as they go across it, it runs a script that gives them tavern behaviors as a package. Uh, things like move to different interior points of interest in the tavern, uh, a higher priority wave or look at or cheer because they're being social. You know, they're, they're seeing some of their friends. And then one of those behaviors at some point is exit the tavern. Of course, when they do that, they go across the tripwire again, which runs the script and removes the tavern behaviors package because they don't need it anymore, right? So just by having the NPC <coughs> say, oh, one of my behaviors is go to the tavern, when they do so, now they know how to act inside the tavern, and when they leave, they don't leave anymore. So the cool thing about this kind of stuff is that the behaviors can be designed once, added to a contextual package, and any character that qualifies can use them. Um, if they're only processed when they're relevant, so you're not sitting there saying, am I supposed to be uh, waving to people in the tavern? No, dude, you're like 175 miles away. Don't worry about it. Um, and there's no scripting other than those triggers which are pushing on and off the behavior packages. It's easily extensible. You can create a new uh, behavior uh, and possibly a corresponding tag, like let's say play darts in the tavern. Okay, great. Yeah, I have a dart animation. When you decide you want to go over there, go stand in the spot, throw some darts, you add it to a package, and now everybody that would ever get the behavior, uh, the tavern behavior package, now would incorporate playing darts. And so this was really important when we tested it uh, in, in uh, Guild Wars, for example. This is Queensdale, one of the starter maps for, uh, the starter map for the, the humans, actually. Um, and to give you a bit of a frame of reference, that is uh, 2,100 meters by 2,800 meters. Yeah, I had my buddy Mike actually just go and look this up. How big is that map, by the way? And to test all of these behaviors, we were only using this part of it, which was plenty. Um, and so, you know, zooming in on that, you know, we would put, for example, we created uh, uh, patrol points for the soldiers. There's a there's a, a fort down there, uh, and then we would you know drop you know like on the tops of these towers and down in the courtyard and over the bridge, and some of them in the village, and then out by the windmill and then over. And we all we did was just drop patrol points and give them a behavior. Go to a patrol point that you haven't seen in a while, but it's fairly you know, close in a relative sense. Uh, and I think we even included that none of the other uh, uh, soldiers are near using influence maps. And the soldiers would just scatter and wander around the town going to and from all these places and so you never knew where they were going to be but if you looked around yeah there's some sol soldiers patrolling and they go and stand at a crossroads for a little while do some other behaviors like waving, saluting to you know, people, looking about and then they would move on to another patrol point. It looked natural, no designer intervention necessary. We have all of those things. Um, the, uh, we also would do, uh, got the wrong glasses on here. Oh, uh, uh, we had a, a pack ox that we tested that would go out of the, the gate of the city, go to the tavern, go to some other place, go to that windmill, pick up some grain, go to the fort. And again, it was just different uh, patrol points specifically for that delivery ox. And we could actually create two or three delivery oxen. And they would just be wandering back and forth between these important uh, places. No designer intervention necessary. Um, so the thing is, though, you can have it because of the pathfinding that we, we did. You can say, here's our starting place right there toward the top, and we're going to go all the way over here to another point of interest, or to that one way the heck over there. <coughs> we can trust that whatever it was that we told to do that was going to look good doing it. It would follow the right path based on its profile, etc. No designer intervention necessary of saying, and then you go here, and here, and here, and boy, did the designers like that. So when you have a big world, like, you know, in the ultimate world, you could set all this up and have all of this interesting space being used in reasonable uh, ways by the NPCs. So, uh, you know, we have the, the control path method that, you know, designers used to use, which was very time consuming to, to place, very rigid and repetitive, not really easily extensible either. Compared to our point of interest method, which is easy to uh, place, very flexible, um, very organic looking because it wasn't a repetitive path, and very easily extensible. You drop in a new place and they know how to use it. You're done. Okay, another thing that uh, is, was a big deal is invisible constraints. Um, let's say you have an NPC and that's where he's anchored to. 
and he said, okay, you are allowed to go in a certain radius around that point. Well, that's what it is. It's an anchor with a chain, and so you can go anywhere as long as you don't get this far from that thing. Well, what happens if, you know, you could stand out here, you know, uh, and get to the edge of, well, that's it, I'm out at the end, so now I have to go all the way back to the center. Tell me that it doesn't look like this. I'm clicking on my, as I'm trying to click on my thing. Oh, there's my mouse, I found it. Yeah. Oddly, that doesn't seem to be working. I'll act it out. <laughs> no. Um, but no, those of you who are my age, uh, one of the great orators of our day, Foghorn Leghorn, uh, knew exactly the rope limit for the dog. So he went up to the dog who was, who was sleeping, spanked him on the butt a few times and ran, and knew exactly how far the dog would go before he had to stop and couldn't get him anymore. Who's done this in an MMO or some other, I know exactly where the limit is, watch this, uh, you can't get me anymore. Okay. Well, by using things like influence maps, we can store relevant data in an underlying grid structure. That's generally how influence maps work. Periodically update that map, um, propagate this information about the objects or the NPCs to some surrounding squares, and give this broad representation of what's going on where. Different influence maps can be used in conjunction with each other. So, you know, for example, we you know, did things for personal spacing in Guild Wars, um, so characters don't stand on top of each other. We had tactical ones for positioning. Am I in the front? Am I staying at range? Am I keeping a safe space away from something? Targeting of AOE spells. I'm going to shoot to the middle of that <coughs> room, wherever the biggest uh, you know, uh, collection of these guys are. You can use it for strategic stuff, concentration of enemies, ecological things like in biomes and land features, where things live. Uh, and you can also use them on a grand scale for you know, civilizations. Whose stuff are we standing in? What territory are we in? Um, so one of the things we did is a, a, a habitat, you know, instead of using an anchor point, we actually would define it based on a biome or geography or something like that, or the amount of danger that was around, uh, or the amount of population because you're trying to stay away from predators, for example. Um, all of that can be done with influence maps. Okay, so let's say we have this particular creature here and it likes to live in the forest. Well, we look at what, what the biome is underneath this grid system that we've done and say, okay, yeah, that's all forest area predominantly. Right, and so the, the creature can wander around and it's completely happy as long as it's staying in the forest, right? It doesn't have a problem with this at all. Now, until it's such and such time when it uh, accidentally wanders outside of said forest and goes, wait a minute, I don't like any of this, this kind of sucks, I am now going to wander to a place that is back in the forest. What can we use this for, right? Well, how about this? Uh, Mike, uh, the guy I mentioned, Mike Lewis, and I created a creature who only liked to be in the forest. It refused to go into the grassland, etc. And we spawned it, and it was chasing me like crazy, and I was running away from this creature. It was trying to beat the snot out of me, and I ran out into the grass. It took five steps, stopped dead in its tracks, and then backed up into the forest and stared at me. <laughs> Which was really creepy. And then if I moved along in the grass, it would parallel me in the forest and keep watching me. But because part of his behaviors were, oh, he's in a biome that I don't like. Remember the whole, you know, uh, required, preferred, likes, neutral, dislike. Hey, it was, we made it for testing purposes. Hey, nope, I'm not going anywhere else. It would refuse to chase me. It would look at me, but it would refuse to chase me. Now compare that to a fixed exact range around an acre. Makes a lot more sense to go, you yeah, know, apparently this thing really likes the forest, and then you can't get me. All right, so procedural <coughs> world information. We talked about this briefly at the beginning of being covering this. Um, world information like, you know, what do NPCs like or dislike? Where things are, are they good or bad? Where people or creatures have been? is good or bad, and allow free movement in that world. And actually in the EverQuest Next reveal, uh, there was the, uh, an example called Orcs by the Road that Dave George talked about, and he actually got it from uh, a GDC uh, Austin lecture I did in 2009. He had forgotten that I had told him about this. It's like, oh, that's where I got it. Yeah, I gave it to you in your office, and, you know. 
Um, it was a great example, yes. <laughs> but um, it was based on this, what I call the tale of two cities. All right, so here's our world. There's these two cities uh, out there, and there's this forest between them. And there's a north road and a south road between the two cities. Um, and uh, NPC merchants, as well as player merchants, travel back and forth, primarily sticking to the roads. But we're keeping track with an influence map using what I call breadcrumbing. Is that when, let's say, rich caravans go through, we're dropping breadcrumbs that this is where rich caravans have been. So over time, that north road that everybody was using has this influence of, this is where stuff like that you know, is going. All right, so we have some orcs that live in this forest. And orcs have a behavior that they like to set up ambushes to ambush rich caravans. They look at the influence map and say, hmm, I wonder where the, oh, look. There's a road nearby that has lots of caravans that travel back and forth on it. So let's go and set up our ambushes there. <coughs> no design or intervention necessary. Okay? So they hang out there and they're ambushing caverns or car caravans, excuse me. And the caravans also have some AI to go, you know what, we're not going to go through roads that go through dangerous areas. And eventually the orcs are kind of making this place dangerous, right? So over time, they start taking the south road instead, and of course that means that the influence for the caravans transfers to the south road instead, and it goes away from the north road. What do the orcs do? Well, this place kind of sucks. Huh, wonder where's the place we could go. Again, no designer intervention necessary. They will pick up stakes and go to the south road. Well, that's kind of cool. They just looked at their world and said, there's information here, what should we do with it? Well, let's say, uh, for example, if the orcs were here, they might say, oh, look, here's a place where we can go, but that's really too close to the city. That doesn't feel right. Why don't we uh, put a, a city influence, you know, that represents like where the patrols are going, and place it around those cities? So now we have two influence maps. One, where have the caravans been, and what is the, the security feeling of a city? So if those orcs were there for some reason, they're not going to go to that closest piece of road. They're going to try to get away from the cities and towards the gold caravans. And so they would go there. Again, no design or intervention necessary. Um, and one of the things, again, this is also my, I shoot Dave about this out, or out about this, <coughs> is he says, it doesn't matter if it's launch, or this, excuse me, this one was his. It doesn't matter if it's launch day or 10 years after launch, you're going to come down that road, and every 15 minutes, those orcs are going to spawn. That's the way we had always done it. This one was mine. I said, in our game, we just create a bunch of orcs and release them into the world. The orcs, of course, will then do what orcs do, um, with no design or intervention necessary. So other uses of this, we could have a big, big bad dragon in the mountains. There's too many players hunting the dragon, so he gets kind of annoyed at this, and he moves away from the players to some hills nearby where now he's feasting on Farmer Ted's cows. That was the before picture. That's why the cow is smiling. Um, they weren't happy after that. Um, so then a quest giver tells you, hey, there's some bad stuff going on at Farmer Ted's place. Can you go and help him out? Little did you know that it's because you guys had chased the dragon away, and now he's eating cows. Um, living areas that we're defining, you know, so we can have things that move towards player areas, move away from player areas because they're shy, moving towards food prey or moving away from predators. And the interesting thing is you can actually have some ebb and flow on this. So here's our two cities, for example. Let's say that a quest giver said, hey, go clear the orcs out of that forest. Uh, okay, we're going to go clear the orcs out of that forest. So you go in there, there's a kerfuffle that happens. Um, and then because of that, the orcs feeling it defeated, flee out of the forest. Well, congratulations, you cleared the orcs out of the forest, right? And because you did that, there are some merchants who did not feel good going to City B because of the, the orcs in the forest. So now they can travel there, and all of a sudden City B is a lot richer, so the bandits that are down here in this forest go and lay waste to City B and you know, are, are you know, terrorizing the people in there, but because the abandons abandoned that forest, the goblins moved in. All of this can give you that dynamic world that is constantly changing just based on the rules alone. You can also do procedural population of things like creatures, humanoids, uh, town inhabitants, 
Uh, we can place them by biome, by civilization influence, by the neighbors in that area, by difficulty ratings. That this is going to be a more dangerous place than others. Uh, and also, of course, by rarity or, you know, are they common or unique? And it can be constrained by the population in the area. We can also have the dynamic spawn points rather than a spawn point. One of the things that Mike and I did is we would have spawn points all over a forest, for example, and say, okay, let's say the players were here and have just killed all of the, uh, the, the deer. Um, and there's a spawn point, the spawn points that are right there near the player. We don't want to spawn the new deer right there where the player is at. Let's turn these on over here and spawn the deer where there are no players and turn those off. So right, based on that, we can also auto balance the population. We define a spawn group with one species or many, define a target population that we're trying to keep, and define a repopulation rate so, and assign that spawn group to these different spawn points. So as the population changes, the spawn points try to push the population towards the target. So there's always 17 deer thereabouts in the forest. If you kill three of them, over the next however much period of time, three more will spawn on the other side away from you. So you're never gonna stand there and go, watch this guys, right there, yeah, yeah, and poof, deer, ha <laughs> ha. So uh, we can also do procedural population. We talked about no more fixed spawn points, so no more repetition. When matched with that habitat, they still conform to real reasonable areas, and it automatically balances out. We can do procedural naming of characters, of habitations, of geographic features like oceans, mountain ranges, and forests. Um, and that way every spawned character seems unique. And it gives a sense of something bigger. We can do procedural naming uh, based on these templates created by race or sub-race or gender or class. Um, <clears throat> by doing things, one of the things I did was I had different segments like first, last, prefix, suffix. So you can say, okay, pick from a list of first names and pick from a list of last names. That's easy enough. There we go. There's one right there. Uh, or, you know, Raph Koster. Uh, or we could have first and then prefix and last. So you might have, for example, a dwarf, Barth, Hard Gem, or Cow, Stone Anvil. You see what we're doing here. These are prefixes we're choosing, these are suffixes that we're choosing. Or we might even put punctuation in there, like first and then prefix, apostrophe, last. So you might have this or that. One of the things we did in uh, Pixel Mage in, in Hero Song is I actually had different prefixes for gender. And so you could tell just by the name that the gender is this a male or a female. Um, and you can get as complicated as you want. You know, we can have you know, things like that, where it is first, suffix, prefix, last. Um, procedural item placement. Again, you can have normal items like sticks and ore and food and gems lying around, or weapons, normal or magical ones, flavor items such as books, uh, and place those by biome, by the civilization that they're nearby, uh, by a difficulty level. Again, rarity, common to unique, uh, and it can be constrained also by the population, or by the, you know, in, in the area. Dynamic dialogue. You can have different greetings for friendly, <coughs> neutral, or hostile ones, uh, taunts, information about the world, whether it be worldwide, regional, town, or local dynamic events, and your player, your characters can talk about those things. We can make them generic or racially specific, use templates to include things such as race, gender, name, or class in the actual subject. This is text-based stuff, obviously. Uh, and we can filter it by all of the above, and based on the disposition, are they hostile or friendly or neutral for you? And use a Mad Libs style dialogue. So they might say greetings, they might say Greetings, elf. They might say, greetings, ranger. Assuming that you're an elven ranger. Uh, they might call you by name if they know you. They might, you can actually put together longer things like uh, uh, greeting some Mark of, what was this tiny town you live Pittsburgh. in? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Greeting <laughs> Mark of Pittsburgh. All right, I have to be accurate here. Um, I am Dave of Omaha. Um, and we can filter it, of course, by race, by class, by gender, by level, by the location that we're in, by someone's origin or their disposition towards you. So if the speaker was an elf and a druid, and the target of who they were speaking to was also an elf or a druid, they might say, protect the forest, elf, or human if there was a druid, for example. Um, or, but if they were an elf or a druid and the target race was a dwarf, they might say, do not defile the forest. And you could have thousands of these. I just had some low-level designers that were just cranking out text 
templates for all of this stuff, and oh my God, did the text look good in our game. Just based on contextual stuff like that. Uh, contextual text sounds really weird to say there. Um, you can have somebody who's a, a, a guard, uh, and the, uh, they're talking to a warrior in a positive way. They might say, good to have some more steel around here, warrior. Uh, or if they're human and uh, they're a guard and they're talking to a wizard who's not human, they might say best not use any of that crazy magic in our town, elf. Um, we also <coughs> did something that we called signposting with this. Um, well, it was one time when I was working for, for John at Pixel Mage. Uh, I love this picture of John because it makes it look like he's casting a fireball. Um, he's, he called me in his office. He goes, Dave, come here. I went, yeah, what's up? This, these guys just said, We've heard reports of the gnolls to the southwest. Yeah? Why would they say that? Well, you dumbass, did you go to the southwest? <laughs> well, no. Go ahead. You went to the southwest, you got jumped by a pack of gnolls. Oh, she, well, wait a minute, whoa, 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 and you got killed. You, what the heck? I said, well, they, they warned you. <laughs> well, how did that happen? It's because they were looking at the influence map of hey, let's just find, you know, something, there's a bubble of a particular sort of race fed into the dialogue system, let's tell somebody about this. So information can be kept on movements of NPCs and monsters, significant events in the world, questing givers can use this dynamic information from the world to notify players of threats to avoid, challenges to overcome. You know, so if we had our city, and there was a fort north of here and a river to the west, and there was a whole bunch of orcs, again, with the influence maps, there's where the orcs are, and if you went to, let's say, the captain of the guard in the city, he uh, said, well, okay, what's going on? What can I, there's a you know, cluster of orcs over here. And they say, the orcs have gathered west of the town near the river. All right, well, let's say you go and kick some orc ass, and you kill some of them, but more of them move in up here, and you go back into town, or somebody else comes up to the, to the captain of the guard. They look, okay, well, here's the, where the, the, the bubble of the threat is now. Let me say, the orcs have regrouped west of the fort, east of the river. This is actually really easy to do in text, folks. Um, and let's say, okay, after a little bit more battle, some of them move over here, and so now somebody else comes up to that same captain of the guard, and again, say it with me, folks, no designer intervention necessary. The captain of the guard says the orcs have moved north of the town near the fort. The game is adapting and changing. You never know what's coming next, but it all makes sense. We can also do procedural quests based on item information, items that we've spawned in the world, using that game world information referenced by the procedurally generated names, using the procedural dialogue with varying degrees of specificity. And what do I mean by that? Well, somebody, uh, a villager, may say, oh, the magic tome of amazing AI is rumored to be lost far to the southeast. Okay, great. That doesn't help me. Uh, well, somebody else might tell you, well, it's rumored to be lost far to the southeast in the empire of the Carolinas. Okay, you're helping me out a little bit, I guess, right? But as you discover people who know more and more about the situation, you might get more and more detail to the extent that somebody might tell you the magic tomb of amazing AI is lost far to the southeast in the fortress of the convention center near the Carolina and city of Raleigh, where it is guarded by a mighty AI programmer and a horde of game developers. And if you went, it would be there. <laughs> because they were just pulling information from the world and delivering it, signposting, again, remember John shooting a fireball, to the, to the characters, or to the players, through that uh, dialogue system. So in summary, let the AI find its own way, even different ways if that's appropriate. Use points of interest, schedules, desires, let the AI decide what to do. Define habitats instead of leashes. Let spawns move around based on criteria, no more fixed spawns. Allow the procedural generation of characters and leverage that procedural generation of names. Allow the procedural placement of items in the world and procedural dynamic dialogue, if your game will allow for this, and write those structures to fill in. Use the world info to signpost interesting things in the world to give the player an idea. You might want to go there. You definitely don't want to go over here. And then use that world info to generate procedural quests. What we're talking about is designing structures instead of rules. Let the AI provide the variety and allow the game to grow and change. You keep providing interesting, dynamic content for your players with no designer intervention. 
So again, yeah, we can take great writers and designers, and you pair them with a pretty badass AI person, and you can be cool together. Thank you.